Th thank you to all of you for, for showing up for this talk. Uh, I'd just like to tell you about how GiveWell got started, what we're trying to do, uh, and go into a little bit of detail on a couple of the organizations that we've evaluated and how they've become recommended, and then what we're planning for our future and how it's different than what we've done in the past. Uh, and then hopefully I'll be able to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so uh, GiveWell started uh, when I was working in finance after college. And after being on the job for a couple of years, a few friends and I wanted to give to charity. Um, we went to Google, I think, and, and literally typed in the word charity to try to find information about what charities do and how well it works. And we were really surprised and frustrated by how little useful information was out there to help donors like us who wanted to get as much impact as possible with our donations give effectively. Uh, and so, you know, we worked uh, essentially part-time doing research, trying to figure out where to give uh, for about six months. Uh, and in that process, we learned how little information was available, uh, but also found ourselves incredibly interested in the research that we were doing. Uh, and so in the middle of 2007, Holden Karnofsky, who's my co-founder, and I, we, we left our jobs, and, and we started GiveWell as a full-time project. And the goal was to be the sort of resource for donors that we had been looking for when we were in the private sector. And so what GiveWell does is we aim to recommend a short list of highly effective organizations that best meet our criteria uh, of a focus on evidence, cost effectiveness, and the ability to utilize additional funding. Uh, as a function of our criteria, we now focus entirely on global health and development. When we got started, uh, and you can still see a lot of this research on our website, we looked both at US domestic causes and also international causes, but after doing the work for a few years, we saw how much further a dollar could go overseas, uh, how much cost, more cost-effective those options were, and, and now GiveWell focuses on global health and development exclusively. Um, we asked a lot of the organizations that we review in terms of data and monitoring and transparency, and so we ourselves are trying to be as transparent as we can. Uh, so, you know, one example is we post audio recordings from our board meetings on our website if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty details of what goes on at GiveWell. Um, but importantly, all the details of our research, uh, you know, what we recommend and what we don't recommend and why are all fully available there. And that's intended to allow people to consider the recommendations we make for themselves and decide whether or not they agree with the methodology that we used. Uh, GiveWell itself is a not-for-profit, and so we raise money from donors who support our operations. Uh, and those donors' goal is to create better, more useful information for the charitable sector. And I think their attitude is that by supporting GiveWell, they enable uh, another set of donors to give more effectively. Um, so what I want to do now is just explain a bit about our, our process and, and criteria, which is how we work, before going into a, a couple of short case studies. Uh, so the, the four key criteria that we are focused on when we're looking at an organization are uh, what's the evidence that its program works, how cost effective is its program, uh, how and whether can it use additional funding that it receives from donors, and then will it be sufficiently transparent that it will share the information that we need with us? Um, so just taking a step back for a minute, the way that our process works is we start by trying to cast the net as wide as we can to look for charities or programs that could meet our criteria. And you know, because we are aiming to recommend a short list of organizations to donors, uh, we can only spend a lot of time on the organizations that we think are going to be most promising. And, and so the first stage in our process is taking, you know, this long list of the thousands of organizations that implement programs in poorer countries, uh, you know, the hundreds of programs that have some evidence behind them and trying to predict and decide which ones will ultimately do best on the answers to these questions, which are criteria, and then spending the most time on the ones that seem like they're succeeding, they're, they're succeeding the best. Uh, so the, you know, the first criterion that we're really focused on, the first question we're asking, is what is the evidence that this program works? Uh, in the vast majority of charitable organizations just don't have information 
that demonstrates that their programs are making a difference. Um, to give one example, when uh, before GiveWell got started and, and I was just a donor trying, trying to give a small amount of charity, I was really interested in the cause of, of water in Africa. And you know, I called up 20 organizations and asked them questions like, you know, how many wells will you dig with, you know, a thousand, with an additional thousand dollars? And, you know, do you check that the wells remain in use over time? Does the water remain clean? Uh, and if it does, what impact does it have on people's health? Um, they, they thought I was crazy, and they said, you know, we, we don't even get questions like this from our institutional donors. You know, why are you asking us these questions? Um, but, you know, that experience has been, you know, essentially the same from the time that, I was just a small donor to the, now that we're at GiveWell, where, where most organizations aren't asked and aren't ready to answer questions like that. And, and so because of that, when we ask this question, we tend to start with uh, the academic evidence for uh, how well programs are performing. Um, so one example of a charity re we recommend is the Against Malaria Foundation. They're a group that distributes malaria nets in Africa. And you know, there are a series, more than 20, randomized controlled trials that were conducted in uh, developing countries that show that when you give out nets, people tend to use them, uh, that these nets do prevent cases of malaria and then reduce child deaths because when, when people use the nets. And so we rely on that sort of evidence to say this program, the distribution of insecticide-treated nets is one that can potentially have a very big impact. Uh, then we'll go out and, and try to find the Against Malaria Foundation and say, you know, do you have evidence that you are effectively able to deliver nets and that people use them? And so in their case, they'll distribute nets or they'll, they'll purchase nets, which are then distributed to uh, people who are at risk from malaria, and they'll go back and conduct follow-up surveys 12 months later, 24 months later, 36 months later, to see whether the nets remain in good condition and whether people are still using them. The, the, the second big question that we're asking is the, the question of, of how cost effective is this program? Um, so, you know, we, let's say we know that malaria nets do reduce cases of malaria, uh, but how much does it cost to deliver some number of nets, and how many deaths does that avert? And, you know, in, in this question, we're trying to get at how much impact the organizations have with every dollar that they spend. Uh, you know, this type of modeling is, is incredibly difficult. Um, there are a lot of uh, difficult judgment calls that, that go into this. Um, and what we try to do is put it all into a model that we put on our website to be as transparent as possible about the judgment calls that we're making in this work. Um, but it is you know, this question, the one of, of cost effectiveness, that drove GiveWell to focus on global health and development. Uh, in, our, in our first couple of years, you know, we, we saw that with a program like Malaria Nets, our best estimate was that $3,500 donated to a group like the Against Malaria Foundation averted a child's death from malaria. Uh, at the same time, if you looked at uh, the sort of charter school programs that we were evaluating as part of the U.S. domestic programs part of our work, uh, that cost about $15,000 a year just to put a child through a year of school. And you know, comparing those two numbers to each other, $3,500 per death averted versus $15,000 for a year of schooling really drove us to want to focus on uh, international causes where it seemed like the dollars could go much further. The, the third big question that we ask the organizations that we're considering is uh, how will they utilize additional funding? Um, and you know, this question is important in a few ways, but uh, there are cases where organizations can't utilize additional funds to do more of the work that they've done well in the past. And, and you know, one example where this was particularly salient for us is you know, we were interested in researching organizations that fund surgeries in, in countries. Uh, so these could be surgeries that uh, repair cataracts or cleft palates, um, and the organization would pay local surgeons to perform these surgeries. Um, but they got to the point where they had exhausted the existing surgical capacity in the country, and, and they weren't able to take additional money and give it to, this to, give it to surgeons and have them do more surgeries because the surgeons were essentially doing as many surgeries as they could. Uh, now, there are certainly 
other ways that one could address that gap, the gap of limited surgical capacity in a country, um, but this organization's uh, experience and track record focused on delivering dollars to help surgeons perform surgeries, and, and that intervention was no longer directly available because they ex had exhausted the existing supply. Um, and so this question of how marginal funds will be used is one we ask of, of all the organizations that we're considering. Um, and then the, the, the final question that we're focused on is the, the question of transparency. Uh, you know, the vast majority of the charity specific information that we need is not publicly available. You know, they're, they're documents and reports that um, organizations have themselves, and we need them to be willing to share them with us, uh, and then be willing for us to share them on our website with the donor community who uses our research for us to be able to work with them. The, uh, so this is the set of organizations that we recommend today. Um, you know, they, they work on programs that focus on malaria, uh, deworming treatment, which is treating children for parasitic infections that are extremely common in poorer countries, um, uh, vitamin A supplementation, which reduces child mortality, um, uh, and then two other programs that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth, because I think they illustrate the type of process that we have, uh, no lean season, which helps with seasonal migration, and Give Directly, which is a group that directly delivers cash to the poorest people in the world. So uh, I'm gonna move on now and, and try to go through uh, the, these two case studies. First, Give Directly, and then No Lean Season. Um, and I should say that in both cases, uh, what I'm gonna say is, is going to say is stay fairly superficial just because of time constraints, but if there's anything I say that you're interested in more information on, I'm sure that you can find the details of it on our website because we have tried to, there's, there's nothing I'm saying now that is not already on our website. Uh, and if you do have any questions, you know, always just feel free to contact GiveWell directly. We're happy to answer. Um, so GiveDirectly is an organization that delivers cash directly to some of the, the poorest families in the world. You know, these are families living in uh, you know, East Africa and are earning, you know, the, the sort of average consumption is less than a dollar a day. Um, and you know, Give Directly's idea was, you know, can we just give out cash and allow people to decide for themselves uh, how, how they will best be helped? Um, now, before Give Directly existed, we at GiveWell had long been interested in the potential for cash programs. Uh, you know, we were, uh, we wrote a blog post uh, back in 2009 where it was called, Why Not Just Give Out Cash? And we were really surprised by the fact that we saw, you know, so many charities delivering, delivering health supplies, uh, running uh, other types of job training programs. Um, but at the time, there wasn't any obvious way for an individual donor to just give cash. And, and in many ways, you'd expect that cash is you know, the, the simplest form of charity. Uh, and so when Give Directly launched and we got connected to them, we were really excited to move forward because we had this sort of strong starting assumption that cash was a promising approach to helping some of the poorest people in the world. Um, and, and so then the way that GiveWell works is, is once we decide to go deep on an organization, uh, we are largely going through a process of asking a lot of questions and trying to find the answers. Um, and you'll see this same method laid out in the charity reviews that are on our website. We lay out a bunch of questions and then we try to answer them. And for any program, the questions tend to focus first on the intervention. So in this case, cash transfers in general, and then uh, at a second level on the organization. How effectively does it deliver that intervention? Um, so in the case of cash, the, the first question we asked was one I mentioned before, which is, you know, what's the evidence, does it work? Does this program actually have the effect that we think that it, you know, that it might? Uh, and, you know, the types of questions that we had were, uh, you know, first, what do people spend money on? You know, do they spend the cash that they receive on what intuitively seem like productive uses on uh, shelter, clothing, food? Or uh, do they spend it on uh, so-called temptation goods, like tobacco or alcohol, where you might expect that the cash you know, wouldn't have the same sort of effect? Um, and you know, in looking at the evidence of cash programs, you know, we very consistently saw that you know, people spend money on, uh, broadly speaking, productive uses, and very rarely spend money on the, the, the sort of temptation goods. Um, you know, another question we had in this case is that 
Give Directly's intervention was different than the way that many cash programs had been run before. Uh, you know, sort of the standard cash transfer program uh, had been a, a small income transfer of about you know, 10 or $15 a month to poor families. Uh, Give Directly was saying, we want to make a large lump sum transfer with the idea that this will enable people to invest in assets or, or do things that they otherwise might not have. And, and the evidence base for that type of cash transfer program was much more limited at the time that Give Directly launched. Uh, you know, working, they worked with research researchers and ran a randomized control trial of their program, of their implementation uh, in Kenya, and they found similarly positive results from their program to the uh, results that they had seen or we had seen in the other trials. Uh, the, the other big question that we had about the program um, is the question of cost effectiveness. You know, how does giving cash compare to other programs that are trying to achieve a similar goal of increasing people's long-term income or their ability to consume what they need. Um, and the way that you know, we've done this is we've tried to compare Give Directly's impact directly to other charitable programs that we have looked at that have a similar goal. Uh, and so in sort of GiveWell's mind, the, the program of, of deworming, treating children for parasitic infections, it you know, may have this long-term effect of increasing people's incomes. Uh, that, that's a long story, which I'm very happy to go into and question and answer if anyone is interested. Um, but we compared, give the, the cost effectiveness of cash transfers to the cost, of net, cost effectiveness of deworming, really focusing on this question of how does the cost for some amount of increase in consumption, how is that different? What's the ratio between what Give Directly achieves and what the deworming organizations achieve? Uh, and uh, if you look at the model that we have on our website, our best estimate now is that the deworming organizations are approximately three to 10 times as cost effective as Give Directly is for the impact that they're able to achieve. Um, now, you know, I throw out those numbers uh, you know, s somewhat easily, but you know, there are best estimates, but there's you know, a really a lot of underlying difficult judgment calls that go into it. And so, and so we don't see those numbers as the uh, sort of final decision on how cost effective these programs are relative to each other, but it's sort of one of the components that goes into our decision making process is trying to take our best estimate of what that final number is. Um, you know, then the other set of questions focused on give directly as an organization. Uh, were they able to effectively deliver cash to the people who needed it? You know, could they get people cash or was it going to be stolen along the way? Uh, you know, were they uh, going to, and ha would people have the money stolen from them after they gave? And so Give Directly uh, created a process for monitoring that was able to detect when problems were occurring. Um, and so there were two types of problems that they have been able to detect over the years. Uh, you know, one is they've found some cases where low-level staff of theirs in country have stolen some of the funds that they were trying to distribute. Um, and that actually gives us more confidence in them as an organization, because uh, the amount of money stolen, uh, I think it was about you know, $25,000 was stolen at one point in Uganda. Um, you know, they're an organization that's delivering about $25 million in cash transfers every year. So it's a very small portion of what they're delivering, but the fact that they were able to detect that and then were willing to disclose it and write about it publicly shows us that their monitoring system is actually identifying the sorts of problems that it should be set up to detect. Um, you know, the other types of concern, the other type of concern we had about D Give Directly is their uh, original model focused on uh, only giving cash to households that were below a certain poverty threshold and not giving cash to other households that were above that poverty level. Um, and the way that they determined poverty level was by looking at the uh, material that a household's roof was made of. So thatched roof houses received cash, uh, metal roof houses did not receive cash. Um, and you know, there's a lot of concerns that you could have about that process, but you know, one of the things that we were most concerned about was you literally had neighbors, uh, one of whom would receive this big infusion of cash uh, and the other one would not. Uh, and you know, what, we, th what they monitored was the level of conflict and disagreement in the village as a result of the cash transfer. Uh, again, they measured fairly high rates of unhappiness among non-recipients of cash, but fairly low rates of 
uh, sort of actual violence or theft of money. Uh, you know, and that, again, gave us some confidence that they were focused on asking and answering the questions that seemed most relevant to determining whether or not they were having the impact that they were aiming to. Um, I think they've now changed their model and are distributing cash to entire villages to avoid this problem. Um, you know, but even now, we still have ongoing questions about give directly and, and cash transfers. Um, you know, some of the questions that are most front of mind for us today are, uh, you know, how long do the benefits of cash transfers persist? Uh, you know, are these benefits that allow people to purchase more over the very short term and then th those effects fade away? Or do they set people on an uh, upward trajectory that allow them to earn more and more over time. Uh, and I think this is you know, highly uncertain. We've built in an assumption into our cost effectiveness model, but it's certainly something that could, the getting better information about this question could affect how we view give directly. Um, and then the other big question is, you know, what are the larger scale effects that these cash transfers have on the people who don't receive them? Um, and this is a question that you know, hasn't been studied particularly well to date, uh, but there's a large study that, that Give Directly has conduct, is, is currently conducting, and it's uh, hopefully like there'll be some data available in the next few months that's going to try to address this question of you know, what effects does, is their program having on the sort of broader economy. Um, the, the second program, the second charity that I want to talk about is a slightly different story. So this is an organization that we recommended for the first time at the end of last year. Uh, it's, it's called No Lean Season, and it's a seasonal migration program in, in Bangladesh. And the idea here is that uh, the program provides agricultural workers with a small loan during the, the lean season. So you know, basically the period between planting and harvest when they have very few employment opportunities at home. Uh, and the idea is that by providing them with this small loan, that incentivizes them to migrate to an area where they might be able to earn more money than they could if they stayed home. Uh, we first learned about this program uh, in, I think, 2011 or 2012 uh, with research that was done by Mushfiq Mubarak, who's a professor at Yale. Uh, and we saw this trial and, and its results, and you know, we were really excited about it because the impact on consumption were very high. Uh, now, you know, when we talked to Mushfiq at the time, you know, we asked him, you know, these results look really great, but you know, is this something that exists? You know, can, can we fund this program? Uh, and at the time, it, it was just a, a research trial, and there was no opportunity for donors to help scale it up. Um, but uh, Mushvik, and then in partnership with uh, Evidence Action, uh, and uh, the, the head at the time, Alex Zwane, and then uh, GiveWell in our incubation grants program, which I will talk a little bit more about in a minute, uh, you know, we gave Evidence Action some funds to see whether or not they could create this as an organization or create this program so that it could be further scaled up uh, and continue implementing the, the model in the field. Um, so again, here, you know, we went through a very similar process of asking the key questions that came to mind to see, you know, whether, to see how it matched up against our other recommendations. Um, so, you know, some of the questions we asked were, you know, very basic ones. Uh, you know, how much do people earn when they migrate? Uh, how much do they send back? Uh, you know, do they migrate again in future years with the incentive and without the incentive? Um, and the answers to those questions were, were fairly positive. Um, but, you know, other questions that we asked as we've gone along, uh, you know, relate to, you know, what is the, uh, I guess you could call it the, the disutility of migration. You know, when, when the, uh, you know, the men, and it's, it's, it's always men who are migrating in this program from the rural areas to an urban area, uh, you know, what is their experience like in that urban area? You know, maybe they earn more money, but you know, maybe that is counterbalanced by some uh, you know, very negative experience that they have in the months that they're working in this new location. Uh, similarly, what's the effect on the families that they left behind. You know, are, do, do, this is a, you know, the, I, and you can imagine a family where the, the father is leaving for three months. Um, presumably that has some sort of effect that on the family that he leaves behind. You know, we, how do we account for that effect in our overall take on this program? Um, and then finally, how does this program's scale up affect the availability of labor at the destination? Uh, you know, maybe at, at very small scale, there's plenty of jobs, but all of a sudden you scale this up to be a much larger scale program and uh, you could run out of available, available um, employment opportunities. 
Uh, so in, in, in all of these questions, you know, I think we, we got some of the answers as the program was growing from its uh, sort of first days to where it is today, but it is, it's still a fairly new, fairly small program, um, and it's, it's one that, that we and the organization and researchers are still watching very closely and, and moving fairly slowly with to see how the answers to the questions change as it grows. Um, you know, just in terms of what it took to get this program off the ground, you know, one of the big questions that they had to answer was, you know, what implementation model should they use in trying to keep this program going? In the original trials, the researchers just delivered uh, a cash subsidy, and it was about the cost of a bus, bus ticket. Um, and as they tried to take this program to larger scale, they decided instead to offer this uh, as a loan that someone could repay. And I think the idea was both that uh, they partnered with a local organization in Bangladesh that itself is a microfinance institution and delivering loans was uh, what that organization does. Um, but also it had the possibility of increasing the cost effectiveness of the program by reducing the cost that it took to deliver it. Um, but this question of you know, what the implementation model is, uh, you know, that remains a very open question. Um, and so I think in this case, the, the big open questions that we continue to have about this program are, you know, what, how will it change as it, as it scales up in the area that it's currently in? Uh, you know, is there promise to take it to other areas? Uh, and, you know, will the repayment on these loans make, mean that the implementation model that they chose is, is really the right one? Uh, so I just want to transition briefly to talk a bit about uh, where GiveWell is going and how that's somewhat different than where we've been in, in our past. Uh, you know, most of what GiveWell has done to date is we, you know, we look out at the world and we say, you know, what research and what charitable organizations exist? And then, you know, looking at that, we determine which groups should be GiveWell recommended charities. Um, you know, in order for groups to make it to that stage where they can be a GiveWell recommended charity, someone else had to provide some funding earlier in, in, in the process to help them get off the ground, um, to fund the research that helped them determine whether their program was working, uh, to give support to build up uh, a monitoring system. And as part of uh, what, what we've called our, our GiveWell Incubation Grants Program, uh, you know, we've delivered funding to help organizations go from where they are to potentially become future GiveWell top charities. Uh, so the example of No Lean Season that I talked about, that was a grant that we made out of the GiveWell Incubation Grants Program. Uh, but other types of support that we've provided have been uh, funding to other startup organizations, an organization called New Incentives, which focuses on conditional cash transfers for immunization in Nigeria, uh, a focus on trying to gather additional research that could better inform the decisions that we're making. So GiveWell Incubation Grants uh, made a grant to uh, in a randomized control trial that was run via JPAL for incentives for immunization in India. Um, and then finally, we've also tried to give grants to help improve the quality of the monitoring that both our top charities are currently doing or the monitoring that other organizations could do to enable them to become future GiveWell top charities. Uh, the, the final piece I want to talk about is just, you know, this question of how does GiveWell evaluate ourselves? And, um, you know, on one hand, a core piece of how we evaluate ourselves is the quality of our research. But, but there's really no objective way to assess the quality of our research. And, and so we aim to be as transparent as we can, as, as open to criticism as possible so that we can make the research as good as it can be. Uh, but the, the research only matters if it's causing donors to, to give as a result of the research that we do. Um, and so, you know, what we track is our money moved. And, and that's the dollars, the funds that, that go to the charities we recommend as a direct result of our research. Uh, and we do a lot of work to, to track that, you know, both by encouraging donors to give through our website directly, um, but also by going back to the charities themselves and asking them what they know about where dollars have come from that they've received. Um, and over the last few years, we've directed about $100 million each year to recommended organizations. Uh, and, you know, one of our goals going forward uh, on, on this side is, is to try and increase these numbers as, as much as possible.
Um, so I uh, want to pause here and, and I guess just open, open things up for, for questions from you. Uh, I really appreciate everyone uh, coming out and, and would just love to hear whatever questions you have. Excellent. Maybe we can take a batch of two or three questions. Um, I'll repeat them back for our web audience and then Ali can tackle them. Uh, my name is David. I'm a second year MBA student. Uh, I was questioning about some of the charities that are already using an RCT backed method. When GiveWell is evaluating them, how much additional sort of burden of evidence gets placed on the charity, like any other institutional donor places a burden of evidence? Similar to your like beginning story, right? A lot sometimes friends or family ask like, "What charity is best to give to?" And ones that maybe not necessarily are in, in your real house of global health and development, uh, would you have uh, recommendations on how to evaluate uh, what charities to give to and like what metrics? Like I know one metric that people have disputed, and I, I, I'm getting more clear. They look at overhead and they say, "Oh, this is this is not an efficient." Charity, right? Um, so just any any guidance on just that process and, and your thoughts on, on things like I don't know if you're a like charity navigator or these websites which try to say which charities do well, which charities don't do well. And this is a I'm, I'm not expecting you necessarily have an answer. There's more of a morality sort of light like, like view on this, but what, how do you reconcile the long term and short term decisions on, on charity so you can perhaps um, save a child's life in East Africa, but if that child is going to grow up and maybe be part of a 56% unemployment rate, or like part of a, a country that has a 56% unemployment rate, does that, how do you reconcile, you know, um, obviously, you know, saving a child's life is important, but how do you reconcile the long term a person's life overall and, and how the impact of a donation in the United States, that is an education donation versus a donation somewhere else. It's a life-saving donation. How that impacts the future of, of, a, of a person's life long term. Great. So, so three questions for in case our web audience wasn't able to hear. One is that what's the additional evidence required from charities that are already implementing an evidence-backed intervention from an RCT? Uh, the second and, and the metrics. Uh, what metrics can we use in addition to what you've shared so far uh, to determine good charities? How do you weight overhead? Um, some of these other groups like Charity Navigator. And then how do you reconcile long-term and, and, and short-term outcomes? All right. I memorized all three of those. <laughs> um, you know, so it, the questions that we ask charities that are implementing uh, evidence-backed program uh, vary heavily depending on the nature of the program that they're implementing, um, but there's no doubt that you know we're imposing a significant burden on them to engage with us, um, and so you know we try to set up our process to be cognizant of that fact. Um, and so what I mean by that is is try to have uh, you know clear milestones along the way so that um, you know they can balance the time that they're devoting to sharing information with us with the uh, potential benefit of getting funding as a result of a give well recommendation. Um, I think, you know, from talking to the charities that have gone through the process, uh, I think that our sort of the first evaluation that we do is uh, sort of similar in intensity to what other institutional donors are, are asking charities to go through, um, but very different in kind because we focus um, primarily on a charity's past activities, you know, what have they done and how well it has worked, uh, you know, rather than just at, like, primarily asking them to tell us how they will use, um, you know, do, do some new project. Um, after that first year, though, you know, where we kind of, they've reached that status of being a top charity, um, the, the burden of engagement with us, I think, is, is far less than it is on an ongoing basis uh, with a donor like, um, you know, a major foundation or a government donor. Second question. Okay, so you know, what do you? 
So it's like a test that you get at MIT. Can you remember so, all so, three so questions? The, the metrics on charities, thinking about overhead and other groups like Char Charity Navigator. Yeah, so uh, you know, overhead is the most common metric that is used, but I think it's you know very a very misguided one to, to be so heavily focused on. Um, you know, if you just imagine some of the charities that that you know, I we, we you can think about a charity that digs wells in Africa. Uh, if they spell, spend 100% of their money on their program, uh, but they dig wells that don't work, that's not an effective organization. What you actually care about is whether the organization is running a program that actually makes a difference. Um, so then, then what can you do? I mean, the, the first answer is there's no good answer, and that's why uh, I left my job to start GiveWell, because I don't think you can answer this question uh, as well as I'd like to in, in a short part-time way. You know, it's something that I think requires a lot of time. Um, but the, the tips I'd give for people who, you know, want to give effectively outside of the recommendations that we made, um, you know, the first is just be as open-minded as possible. You know, a donor can say, um, you know, is this particular charity a good one? Um, on the other hand, like, let's say what their, that charity is a, is a food bank. You know, they, they don't need to focus on a particular food bank. You could say, well, what is the best food bank in the, you know, the Boston area? Um, and, and just opening up the, the sort of scope of that question, I think, is, is one way to have uh, much more effectiveness. Uh, you know, another question is to just ask the charities, uh, how do you know whether or not your program is making a difference? And, uh, you know, see what answers you get to the question. Um, and then the final one is, is ask them, you know, what they would do differently with additional donations uh, and check back a year later and see whether they actually did the things that they described. Uh, we, we wrote a blog post that lays out some of these that are called, it's, it's called something like Six, six Tips for Giving Like a Pro. Um, nice clickbaity title. Uh, didn't get a lot of clicks. Uh, <laughs> But the, the, the post is up there on our website, and, and we'll go into that in a little more detail. Yeah, so I mean, sites like Charity Navigator, and, and really any site that's trying to rate a huge number of organizations based on, uh, you know, basically publicly available data is just not able to answer the question that donors really need, which is how effectively are they helping the people that they're trying to serve? Um, you know, Charity Navigator is, is trying to get to that, but I think that's the sort of question, um, you know, that even when you go to the level of depth that we have, we still have lots of open questions about uh, the organizations that we review. And a site like Charity Navigator that's looking at 10,000 10, organizations just doesn't have the ability to answer that question effectively. And then the question on the outcome, long run and weighing, reconciling short run and longer run outcomes. Yeah, so I mean, I think th there's actually two separate questions here, both of which are, are, are really salient to give Wells work. Um, you know, the, the first one, you know, that, that, that you framed as short term versus long term, but you might also look at it as um, easier to measure versus harder to measure outcomes. Um, you know, th this is a big, a big challenge for us. Um, you know, there, there's nothing that is inherent to GiveWell's approach that requires us to only focus on the measurable outcomes. Um, but, but what is core to our approach is that we want to be able to make recommendations that don't default back to, uh, you know, the expertise that GiveWell has or, you know, our subjective judgment about what is good and what is not. Instead, we want to be able to make a, uh, you know, a database case or at least a, a, a reason-based case that the outside world could read, understand, and disagree with. Um, and that means that it's much easier for us to engage with the more measurable parts of the charity world and, and not the less measurable parts. Um, our, our aspiration going forward, and, and we've taken some steps in this direction, is, is to try and tackle the less measurable activities, um, but it will be really challenging because of that constraint that we want to be able to make that case that doesn't ultimately just rely on our judgment. Um, you know, the, the other question you asked about was moral values. You know, how do you weigh uh, you know, increasing incomes versus saving child's lives? Um, you know, and, and this is, is something that, uh, I mean, we have, we have no answer to, but we, all, we are forced to make that choice when, you know, we try to allocate the funds that we're responsible for. Um, and so every year we say, you know, how much do we give to 
the Against Malaria Foundation, which is saving child's lives versus the uh, Give Directly, which is you know, increasing people's incomes. Um, the, the way that we've done this is we you know, first tried to look at what research already existed about how policymakers themselves try to make these trade-offs between uh, you know, different types of moral good. Uh, and frankly, th there's some information about this out there, but nothing that is uh, you know, particularly reliable or I would want to just rely on ourselves. Um, the literal process we've used to date is staff members at GiveWell will put in their values for how they would trade off between different moral values, and those values ultimately inform the recommendations that we make. Uh, we don't like that process, that it's just you know, this small staff of, of ours that's, that's making those decisions. Um, and so what we're trying to do is find ways to gather more information that could help us inform this process. Um, and what we're doing now is we're working with a group called um, ID Insight. They're a, a group that does uh, high quality evaluations of programs in, in poorer countries. And for, um, you know, with them, they're working to gather more data on uh, beneficiary preferences. You know, how, how, would, how would the people whom we're trying to help, how would they make the trade-off between you know, averting a death and having additional income? Great, we have two uh, questions from the web that I wanted to, to ask. One is, do, are there differences in recommendations that you make for smaller donors as opposed to larger donors such as open philanthropy? Is, is, there, is there a different process that you use to recommend programs for them? Um, and second is, in terms of you know, some Charities, smaller organizations aren't ready for an RCT, but to be able to make a case that they're doing effective work, how do you recommend, what are your top two tips for where they should start to, to generate evidence or how they should start to generate evidence? Got it. Um, so our recommendations are the same, whether they're for big donors or small donors. Uh, you know, uh, Good Ventures, which is a foundation that has, has given substantially to our recommendations over the last few years. Uh, it was started by Dustin Moskovitz and Carrie Tuna. Dustin is one of the co-founders of Facebook. Uh, you know, we make the same recommendations to them that, that we make to everyone else. Um, and so, uh, you know, literally the, the sort of $10 donor is giving to the same place as the, the $10 million donor. Um, in terms of the other question, which is? Which is, uh, so some NGOs are, are not well situated to set up a large RCT. Like, and if they want to begin to demonstrate evidence of effectiveness, what would your top two tips be for them? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, um, the, the, the approach that seems best to me is you know, really trying to set up a system that, can, that could find failure. Um, you know, that, that is not, you know, a lot of the evaluations that I've seen, it, it, it was never plausible that they would have determined that the program was not working. Um, and so when, you know, in a sense, GiveWell is one of those small organizations that's trying to determine whether or not we're having impact. And so when we evaluate ourselves, I mean, we're, we're probably still failing in the ways that, you know, anyone might, but having a goal of being open to, to finding failure and, and to really seeing things go wrong, I think is probably the single most Im important aspect of the sorts of evaluations that we want to see. You talked a little bit about scale effects, and I wonder how you feel about give well, give, give well scalability in that at the moment you're kind of just moving some charitable donations around on the margin, and I've no doubt they're going to the charities. But if, there's, if you could snap your fingers and tomorrow there was no more domestic aid donation and it was all funneled to international sources, do you think that would be a good thing? And how does that play about how you think about the future if you become bigger and more successful? Just a general question, a question on the general equilibrium effects of, uh, of contributing to GiveWell and moving money from, potentially from domestic towards international causes. How do you feel about GiveWell scalability? Yeah, I mean, if, if we had to deal with that situation, we'd, we'd have to approach it differently. Um, and, and so because we're very far from it, it's not a question that, that really weighs on us. Um, you know, instead, the, the situation we see ourselves in is that collectively, the groups that we've recommended to date you know, we think they could effectively utilize. So sort of their collective room for more funding in our terminology is around $300 million a year. Uh, we're only able to direct them about $120 million a year. So there's sort of a vast 
amount of funding they could still receive before they start having those significant diminishing marginal returns. Um, you know, if we were in some other world where we were directing, you know, I don't know, anyhow, huge amounts of funds, then we'd have to take a different approach because we would quickly surpass the capacity of the organizations that, that we know about that are effective to utilize those funds. How do you fund your research? Do you have like a team of 20 analysts doing this research or how are they paid? Is it competitive? Like giving an idea for like how you, how you manage to like run GiveWell and have like an effective team. So, question on how GiveWell funds its research. Yeah, um, so I mean we're a nonprofit and we, we just you know need to raise money from donors to support our operations. Um, you know, we're, we're a pretty small team and, and we operate on, on a fairly small budget compared to the amount of funding that we direct. And so we've been really fortunate over time that we, we really haven't had trouble raising our operating budget. Our, our operating budget is, is around $3 million a year. Um, and then our, 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 our goal um, in terms of how we compensate our team is to make compensation a, a non-issue overall. And, and what I mean by that is we you know, don't want to pay people so much that they would want to come to work for us for the money, um, but we also don't want anyone to not take the job because we're, we're not paying enough. Um, and, you know, we definitely are not trying to compete then with, you know, with what a, a tech company could pay someone. We, you know, people do have to take some discount to work for GiveWell, um, but we don't want someone to really have a sort of material, material effect on what they're able to do with their lives because they came to work for us. So given like the vast amount of charities that exist in the world, how do you initially cast your net and then start to narrow it down as to which charities you're going to evaluate? Okay. Great. So how do you, how does GiveWell determine which charities it's going to invest time to do research on? Yeah, I mean we 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 literally start you can you can uh, every US registered charity um, has a code on their tax files a tax form with a little code that says whether or not it works internationally. Um, so one of the first things we did is we went through 10,000 tax forms just to you know, know what, what basic activities charities undertook. Um, now, a lot of the groups we recommend are not US registered charities. They're international groups. Um, so we tried to get you know, lists of groups that, that work on programs. And I mean, I think I personally have gone to you know, more than 1,000 charity websites just trying to ask basic questions about you know, what do they do and what's the evidence that it works. Um, and so you know, we basically just try to start very broadly um, and then have, try to have some you know, basic heuristics for narrow, narrowing down the field um, and then slowly spend more time with them over time. Um, and, and again, I think if you go on our website, you can see all of the organizations whose websites we went to and um, sort of how they scored on the different heuristics that we used to decide which ones to prioritize. This is a question that might be um, a bit difficult, almost like a, as an empirical question, but I was wondering if you have a sense, at least anecdotally, thinking about um, shifting donations to international development, um, and specifically whether you have a sense of your uh, objectives or sort of your impact as um, potentially crowding out domestic um, donations versus sort of bringing in marginal donors who aren't donating because of the very reasons that you mentioned in your motivation for founding GiveWell, which is to say that on one hand you might be um, changing the composition of what people donate, but you might also be expanding the pool of donations because people are now willing to donate that weren't otherwise willing to donate. So kind of a question on are to what extent are we moving money from domestic to international towards to bringing in additional or new donors? Yeah, so um, we, we survey our donors to ask them the question of what they would have done in GiveWell's absence. Um, and, and so what they tell us is about, you know, most of them are either reallocating from international organizations to GiveWell's top charities, and, and so the, and those tend to be uh, sort of big name international organizations, so like UNICEF, Red Cross, Oxfam, um, are like the sorts of names that they'll 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 mention. Um, and then others will say that, um, you know, sort of as you described, that that GiveWell's research gave them the confidence to give more than they would have in our absence. Uh, you know, th these surveys are not you know very methodologically rigorous, and we we don't really have a sense of what the the true counterfactual is. Um, but it, it's a really important question for us in trying to have a better sense of what impact, what, what the impact is that we're actually having.
Please. Do you have another question from our online audience? Okay. Um, do you ask that the organizations you support have one or two other funders at the same time too, as to avoid um, dependency on one major donor? Okay. Do you like, so do, does GiveWell ask more likely to invest in organizations that have are not dependent on just GiveWell as a donor and have other uh, funding streams? Yeah, I mean, so uh, we see, you know, we, we often are trying to make a risk reward calculation in the decisions that we're making. And if we're the only funder, then, you know, it's a higher risk proposition because there's some possibility that, you know, the organization wouldn't exist if we didn't continue to support it. Um, but in cases where we think the, the upside is high enough, we, we have been and we'd be ready to be a, a group's um, only funder. Uh, so in, in, in one case that I mentioned earlier, the, the group called New Incentives, which does uh, conditional cash transfers for immunization in Nigeria. Uh, we're not literally their only funder, um, but we certainly account for the vast majority of their funding, but we think they're so promising that we're, we're willing to take that risk in their case. Great. I think we have time for one final question. Uh, do you see GiveWell engaging uh, with policymakers or those who manage aid at sort of the government or regional level? Do you see that as a role for your organization or maybe so to what extent does GiveWell advise other uh, donors on, on their charitable contributions? Specifically those who work with donations of aid at the government level, so like advising, for instance, a USAID type organization as opposed to private organizations. So specifically bilateral, multilateral uh, contributors to international aid. Yeah, I, I mean, we would we would very much like to do that because I think you know if we were able to enable those funders to give more effectively, we, we could have a lot of impact. Um, the, the challenge that we face is that you know GiveWell was was set up around the idea of serving donors that were similar to the the type of people that Holden and I were when we started GiveWell, and so pretty much everything that we've did been we've done has been targeted at helping individuals decide how to give effectively. You know, individuals who don't know a lot and, and don't have a lot of time to spend on their charitable giving. Um, but I think at this point we are hopeful that the knowledge we've built up and the approach we've taken could be helpful to others. And, and so we're aiming to see whether or not we um, you know, can be helpful to people in that position. Well, on behalf of JPAL and the economics department here at MIT, thank you very much, Ellie, for joining us for D squared, P squared. Everyone give them a round of applause. Thank you.